turn to the book of Ephesians and chapter 6. We've been looking at this matter of the whole armour of God. <coughs> Ephesians chapter 6, page 1911. I'm going to read from verse 10. It says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armour of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armour of God, that you may be able to resist in the evil day, and having done everything, to stand firm. <clears throat> stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And in addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you'll be able to extinguish all the flaming missiles of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert, with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. And pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth, <clears throat> to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in proclaiming it, I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. I want to just continue thinking a little bit about the shoes of the gospel we touched on last week. And you may remember I said that four things <clears throat> uh, struck me from that verse 15. It is good news. It's joyful news, the gospel. <coughs> it's an amazing thing that God has done. And it's the gospel of peace. It's not a gospel of happiness. It's not a gospel of healing. It's not a gospel of anything else. It is the gospel of peace. And it's to be worn as shoes. This is something to do with our going. It is something to do with our going. Shoes we put on to stand. And we need to stand. Shoes that we put on to walk. And the Bible says we need to walk. And shoes to put on to run. Because there's a race which is set before us. And we need our shoes. We need the gospel of peace. <coughs> if we're to go and walk or run or stand by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it has to do with a readiness. And that's what I want us to think about again this morning. If you'd like to turn to Colossians and chapter 1. The book of Colossians, page 1926. And I'll read from verse 13. <clears throat> For he delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself 
might come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven, although you formerly were alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. There are two kingdoms, we're told. The kingdom of darkness, under the domain of the God of this world, Lucifer the devil, and there's the kingdom of his beloved son. And the Bible is very clear, there's no other. There's no kingdom of grey. There's just a kingdom of darkness. And as sinners we are in that kingdom of darkness. It takes a lot for people to even accept that they are sinners. But God has given us the law to bring forth the knowledge of sin. And God has given us a conscience to convict us that we are sinners. And we need to recognise that we are sinners. That we fall short of the glory of God. That we're separated by our evil deeds. It is one thing for a man to accept that he's a sinner. It's quite another for him to see that he is an enemy of God. That he is at war with God himself. That he is at war with the Creator. The one who gave him life and granted him a soul. The one to whom ultimately he will give an account on that great day when the small and the great alike will be gathered before a great white throne and he who sits upon it is holy and righteous and true. And a book will be opened. And it is the book of life, the Lamb's book of life. And if anyone's name is not found written in the Lamb's book of life, if he's not come over to the Saviour, if he's not cast himself upon the mercy of God and called upon the glorious name of Jesus to be saved, if he's remained in that darkness, if he's remained as an enemy of God, then the wrath of God, the wrath of God, that which he never comprehended, that which he could never see, that which hovered over him all the days of his life, the wrath of God will fall upon him on that day. And the very one who bled and died so that he could be forgiven will indeed cast him into blackness of darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And every soul that has ever lived will recognise what an awful and wicked nature he had as an enemy of God and will weep and blaspheme for all eternity in darkness in the flames, dear friends. What an awful enmity it is. To see that one is a sinner is something. To see that he's an enemy of God is something else. That's what we've read. And that is the awful state of affairs, dear friends. That all of mankind is in a kingdom of darkness. And as an enemy which is the creator. And the glorious good news. That God once heralded. Screamed from the housetops. There's reconciliation. Because God himself wants to make peace. God wants to be reconciled with sinful mankind. 
with enemies, with rebels, with those who wave their futile tiny fists at him every day of their life, God has made a way for us to be reconciled. And Colossians here tells us what God has done to bring that reconciliation. All the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in a man, born of a virgin in Bethlehem. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and of truth. No ordinary man who walked this earth, dear friends, fully God and fully man. And the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost and to reconcile sinners to himself, to bring us back to God. And there's joy in heaven when men will humble themselves and turn and call upon God for his mercy and call upon Jesus to be Lord and Saviour of their lives. And it's good news of great joy. Not only for men and women who are saved, but in heaven the Father is pleased. There is rejoicing in the very presence of the angels over one sinner. Who repents. Oh, that one sinner would repent here today. That joy would be in heaven today over one coming back to the Father through the Son and calling upon Jesus to forgive and to cleanse and to change. No more rebellion. No more going my own way. I want to come to the Saviour. I want to be reconciled. I want peace with God. What a joyous thing, this gospel. God's gospel. Isaiah chapter 61. Isaiah 61 and verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Jesus read this in fulfillment of himself and his appearing. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me. He was God's anointed one. He was the Christ, the Messiah. To bring good news to the afflicted. Send me to bind up the broken hearted. Proclaim liberty to captives. Freedom to prisoners. The Proclaim the favourable year of the Lord. It's a favourable year. It's a time of salvation. For anyone who will come. As the afflicted and broken hearted. Realising that they're enemies of God. That they need to be reconciled. They need to be put right. And while we're yet without strength at the right time, Christ has come to bring us back to God and to make peace. To make peace. I remember the glorious day when this truth came to my own heart. And I knew I was an enemy. I knew my life was filthy. I knew that I was a rebel. I knew I'd been waving my little fist at God for 28 years of my life. And that wounded my heart. It pierced me. The Spirit of God brought a conviction that I was in darkness. I needed to be reconciled. I needed peace with God. And there was only one who could bring me. And it was Jesus. And so I bowed to him. And I called upon his wonderful name. It's an amazing thing that God has done. 
turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I don't know if they still have a, a town crier that goes out in, uh, they, they did for a time in Canfus, I remember. They still got one. They still got one. The men, they dress up and, and they put the fancy hat and everything on and they go out into the village square or whatever uh, and they'll have a scroll and they, they'll unscroll the thing and, and, the, and they'll cry and they'll herald. Oh yay, oh yay, or something like that. God's called us to be heralds, dear friends. The King of Kings has sent us as ambassadors, as heralds, to go forth into the world, to call people to attention, because the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords wants to make peace before that great and awesome day. And divine wrath will come. And he's enlisted a motley crew. The body of Christ. Second Corinthians chapter 5. I read from verse 9. It says, therefore also, we have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. What do we do? Persuade. Well, if we have the fear of the Lord, dear friends, we persuade men. Do you have the fear of the Lord this morning? Or are you smitten with the fear of man? Because Jesus says <clears throat> that we shouldn't fear men. Because the worst that they can do is kill our bodies. <clears throat> but we should fear him. And what, he, what can he do? He can not only kill the body, but he can cast soul and body into hell. And he will. We should fear him. Do we fear him, dear friends? Do we have that fear of God? Do we see that there is this awful enmity between sinful mankind and our blessed God And God is offering pardon. God is offering reconciliation. God is saying, go as ambassadors, as heralds, and tell the people there's peace. They can come and be reconciled because of what the Son has done on Calvary's cross. The shedding of his precious blood. We're not again commending ourselves to you, but are giving you an occasion to be proud of us, that you may have an, an answer for those who take pride in appearance and not in heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we're of sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us, constrains us. Having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all. That they who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no man according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. 
Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. reconciliation. Namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. He's committed to us the word of reconciliation. What a strange thing for God to do. The God at enormous expense, the suffering of his own son, is seeking to reconcile a whole domain of darkness, of rebels who hate him. To make peace with them through the blood of his cross. And he's entrusted that message of reconciliation to a people who have tasted of the kindness of the Lord. To a people who have known the goodness and the mercy and the amazing grace of God. And he said, you're ambassadors now. You are my representatives. The world is still at war. The, the sinners are still en enemies with me. My wrath is resting upon them and will be poured out. And you can tell them there's peace with God through Jesus Christ. There's peace. And for everyone that repents, there's joy in heaven. I stretch out my hands all day long to a rebellious, disobedient people. My hands are open to receive them. If they will but turn, humble themselves. <coughs> Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were entreating through us we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. How many people have we begged on behalf of Christ? How many have we truly entreated and pleaded with to recognize their enemies? They're at war with their Creator. That one day all the wrath of God for their sin will be poured out upon them. But indeed it was poured out upon Jesus so that they didn't have to face that. And we're ambassadors. We're heralds with a message. You can be put right. You can be reconciled. You can have peace with God through Jesus Christ. He made him who knew no sin. Sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. How? Through faith in Jesus Christ. Working together with him, we urge you not to receive the grace of God in vain, for he says at the acceptable time, I listened to you, on the day of salvation I helped you, behold, now is the acceptable time, now is the day of salvation. But dear friends, time's running out. Time's running out. We need urgently to put on the shoes of the gospel of peace, to stand, to go and to run. Because God's wrath is coming. The day of the Lord is near. It will come as destruction from the Almighty. God's patience is running out fast, dear friends. The wickedness of this earth it's filling up the cup of, cup of God's wrath and it's about to be poured out and sinners need to be reconciled. They need peace with God. 
through Jesus. Turn to Luke chapter 14. A couple of scriptures to illustrate. Luke 14, reading from verse 15. When one of those who were reclining at the table with Jesus heard this, he said to him, Blessed is everyone who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. And he said to him, A certain man was giving a big dinner, and he invited many. And at the dinner hour he sent his slave to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is ready now. Mm. What is this readiness? It's a readiness of the gospel of peace, dear friends. We've got a glorious message. Everything's ready. It's <coughs> done. Everything that God needed to do to provide the way for sinners to come back to Him, it's done. It's ready. It's finished. You can come. You're enemies, but you can come. It's all ready. If you'll humble yourself, if you'll repent, if you'll turn, if you'll call upon the Saviour, it's all ready. Matthew chapter 22. Jesus answered and spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. He sent out his slaves. What did he do? He sent them out. Did they go barefoot? No, they had their sandals on. He sent them out to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast. They were unwilling to come. Again he sent out other slaves saying, Tell those who have been invited, Behold, I have prepared my dinner. Is it prepared? Is it ready? Mm -hmm. Yes. Everything's prepared. It's done. You've just got to come. They paid no attention. And they went their way. What an awful thing, dear friends. We can go to a world that's lost in rebellion to God, in the domain of darkness. We can herald the good news. God has prepared a way for sinners to come back to Him. And it's all prepared. It is finished. Christ died for our sins once and for all. It's finished. Everything's ready. There's nothing else to be accomplished. You just simply need to repent. You need to finish your rebellion and your enmity with God. Humble yourself and bow the knee and call upon the Saviour. It's ready. Come. God wants to be right. He wants to make peace. He doesn't want to pour out His wrath upon you. You can come. But they went their way. They went their way. They heard the invitation. They heard the herald. Pronounce Him peace. Peace. went their way. What a tragedy. There are shoes, dear friends, and we're commissioned to go. I want to close with a few scriptures to encourage us and to exhort us. Turn to Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15, verse 16. 
Paul says to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, ministering as a priest, the gospel of God, that my offering of the Gentiles might become acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. What was he doing? He was offering to God as a priest, the gospel of God. We can share the gospel, dear friends, and we can do it as an offering to God. Isn't that wonderful? Do you believe that you're a priest this morning? That you don't have to wear fancy clothes and a funny hat and a long scarf? No. It was always God's desire that we should be a kingdom of priests, dear friends. And we are all priests unto our God. And we can all offer to Him as an offering a proclamation of the gospel as praise. Praise the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Mm -hmm. Verse 17, Paul says, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not in cleverness of speech, that the cross of Christ should be made void. <clears throat> what, did we, what did he send him to do? Preach the gospel. What are we supposed to go for? To preach the gospel. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Verse 12. Paul says, Now what? When I came to Troas for the gospel of Christ, when a door was opened for me in the Lord. What did he go to Troas for? For the gospel. Where does God lead us, dear friends? And why? What have we got shoes on for? Why do we walk? Why do we run? <coughs> why do we go? It's for the gospel, dear friends. known the Lord long enough now to look back and see how so many over the years have gone wrong. And I think back and I, I've heard so many people come up to me and say, well, I, I believe the Lord's told me to do this, or I believe the Lord's told me to go here, or go there. What for? Oh, I don't know. Dear friends, if God has led you anywhere, I can tell you why. If God has put you anywhere, I can tell you why. If you've walked, if you've run, if you're standing anywhere, I can tell you what you're there for. You're there to make known the gospel. Amen? Amen. Why did we come here? Why did God bring me from God's wonderful, gracious county of Yorkshire? to this dark depths of depravity. <laughs> to preach the gospel, dear friends. And if I'm here wondering why has God brought me to this miserable place, then I'm a fool. Because there's one reason that I have shoes. It is that I should be ready to preach the gospel, dear friends. 
and make Jesus known. I'm an ambassador to herald a message. The King of Kings, who's coming back soon, wants to make peace with rebellious sinners. And he shed his precious blood on Calvary's cross. And that's glorious good news for any who will humble themselves and repent. There's too many people saying, God's told me to do this and God's told me to do that. And they're not preaching the gospel. God only leads you for one reason. God only takes you for one reason. Paul didn't get to throw us and think, what on earth am I here for? No, God sent me to throw us to preach the gospel. And God's taken you where he's taken you for one reason. To reach people that maybe nobody else can. So get on and preach the gospel. Or accept that you're in bare feet. And you're in danger of getting hurt. Because will you stand with no shoes on? Will you walk with no shoes on? Will you ever run? No offence, African brethren. You can. I was amazed. When the girls came over. And someone decided to have a race. And off they went. Shoes and socks off. But I'm not going to run <laughs> without shoes. My feet aren't up to it. God has provided shoes for us, dear friends. Go <coughs> to the book of Philippians in chapter 1. <coughs> I'll read from verse 21. Paul says, for to me to live is Christ, to die is gain, but if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labour for me. I do not know which to choose, I'm hard pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart to be with Christ, for that is very much better, yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Convinced of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for the progress and joy in the faith, so that your proud confidence in me may abound in Christ Jesus through my coming to you again. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Why do we conduct ourselves in the right kind of way? For the progress of the gospel, dear friends. Why do I try and behave myself and not be a pain in the neck? I fail miserably. For the sake of the gospel, dear friends. First Corinthians chapter nine. <laughs> Read from verse twenty two. Paul says to the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I become all things to all men that by all means, <clears throat> some might be said, and I do all things for the sake of the gospel, that I may become a fellow partaker of it. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. And everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Therefore, 
I run in such a way as not without aim, I box in such a way as not beating the air, but I buffet my body, I make it my slave, lest possibly after I preach to others I myself might be disqualified. Why? Why do I spend so much time trying to get my fleshly members under control? Why? To run the race. Run the race for what? The gospel, dear friends. I do everything for the gospel, Paul says. Why is he running a race? For the gospel. Why has he become weak? To win the weak. Why does he live like a Jew? To win the Jews. Why does he live like a Gentile? To win the Gentiles. Why does he do what he does for the sake of the gospel, dear friends? All for the gospel. Turn to Galatians. And chapter 6. One last scripture. Galatians 6. And verse 14. Paul says, may it never be that I should boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus, through which the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. For neither is circumcision anything, or uncircumcision, but a new creation. And those who will walk by this rule, peace, and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. Live by what room? That the only thing that we boast about is the cross of Jesus Christ, dear friends. We make it our boast. We lift up that perfect sacrifice. We point people to the Saviour. Every step we take, we do it with gospel shoes. We walk by this rule, and peace and mercy be upon us. And all the Israel of God. Are you in peace, dear friends, with God? I don't believe you'll truly know the peace that God intended for you. So you firmly got your shoes on. I guess they are the shoes of the gospel of peace. And if you live by that rule, and make everything for the sake of the gospel, there's a peace, dear friends. There's a peace. Amen. May God bless his word to us this morning. Let's commit ourselves to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for your precious word. And we, we pray as we consider this whole matter of the, the armour of God and being rightly dressed and, and, and walking with you. Lord, help us. Help us with this matter of the the shoes of the gospel of peace. Lord, help us in everything we do to do it for the sake of the gospel, to herald this glorious message of reconciliation that rebels can be put right with the Almighty through the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, what a joyous and wonderful message you've given to us. Lord, help us to make it known. We ask in Jesus' name.